Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Hall Jamison. I direct the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. It's my pleasure to welcome you and to introduce Susan Netz, who is a distinguished fellow of the Annenberg Public Policy Center, a former FCC commissioner, and the director of our Transatlantic Working Group. Susan will moderate the panel and will introduce our other guests. Susan. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, and thank the Annenberg Public Policy Center for hosting today's conversation on the right to anonymity and its challenges. Our distinguished panelists are Jeff Kossif, Associate Professor at the US Naval Academy and author of the United States of Anonymous. Danielle Citron, Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. Jeff Jarvis, Professor and Director of the Tau Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the City University of New York, and David Kay, Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine, and former UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right of Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Jeff Kossif literally wrote the book on Section 230 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the 26 words that created the internet. It is the definitive work on platform liability for user-generated posts. He now has published a book on anonymity in the United States. It combines a law professor's thorough analysis of history and case law with a journalist's clarity of expression. It too will become the defining authority on anonymity online. We'll talk with Jeff about how and why the First Amendment protects speech. We'll then broaden the discussion with Jeff and our other panelists to explore the international human rights implications and the pressures facing anonymous speakers worldwide. But anonymity is not just a virtuous shield. It can be a malicious sword. It facilitates cyber stalking, attacks on intimate privacy and harassment online. What can be done to address these harms? And finally, we'll talk about encryption and concerns that some legislation to address online harms by limiting anonymity may have unintended consequences. Once we open the round table for questions, if you'd like to ask a brief question, please press the raise hand button found under reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. When I call on you, please unmute your mic and then mute it again afterwards. You know the drill. Let's begin. Jeff Kossif, author extraordinaire. First, let's, let's talk about what is anonymity and how is it different from pseudonymity? Yeah, so thanks for having me here. And I have to just give the quick disclaimer that I'm not speaking on behalf of the US military. Uh, and with that said, uh, anonymity, uh, and, and I, I really, it has a lot of definitions. My favorite actually comes from the report that David wrote at the United Nations in, in uh, 2015, which is the condition of avoiding identification. And there are different sort of flavors and levels of anonymity from untraceable to traceable, meaning that you might appear anonymous, but there might be data like an IP address where your identity could be traced back through one or more intermediaries. Uh, pseudonymity is where you don't use your real name, but you use a pen name or some sort of persistent identifier that can track the same person over time. So you might have a reputation built uh, along with that speech, even if it's not using your real name. That's really helpful because they are different concepts and we often uh, confuse them. What role does the First Amendment play in protecting anonymity? And what do you mean by the culture of anonymity empowerment? So the First Amendment, uh, it really began in the late 1950s where uh, there were Southern states that were trying to require the NAACP to disclose its member lists. And obviously there, were, there was good reason to not comply with that. And, the Supreme Court in 1958 found a right to anonymous association under the First Amendment. And uh, it extended that a few years later and continued to reaffirm this to a very strong, not absolute, but a very strong right to anonymous speech. So uh, really applying very tough scrutiny to things like laws that require people to put the name of the author on a handbill. 
that they're distributing. And the rationale is that really inherent in the ability to speak freely is the ability to speak under a pseudonym or anonymously. And that really traces back to the history of our country when so many foundational documents like uh, Common Sense and the Federalist Papers were not written, at least initially, with the author's real names. And uh, it's important to note the First Amendment, and this often gets confused in a variety of contexts recently, it only applies to the government's action. So it prevents the government from, let's say, telling Facebook that you must require all of your users to post under their real names. But it doesn't prevent Facebook from requiring people to post under their real names, which it does. Um, so, the, so the culture of anonymity empowerment that I talked about in the book is really um, the ways in which uh, primarily the law, but also technology have helped people to at least control their the publicity of their identifying information as it's associated with their speech. You say that anonymity is not just a free speech issue, but also a privacy issue. Can you explain, please? So this has particularly become important in recent years, um, where I, I think, as I talked about, the First Amendment applies to state action. So as more and more identifying information is in the hands of private companies, more is gathered, whether it's geolocation data or facial recognition data, uh, and also, frankly, with more people just sort of posting maybe various hints online that can be pieced together, uh, there, there's often a false sense of security in being able to be anonymous, and it's harder to be anonymous. And I, I think privacy law could play uh, a role in helping to at least helping individuals to at least partly control their uh, their identifying information and reducing the likelihood that it would be linked to their speech. Are there any efforts underway, for example, in Congress to address uh, either the privacy or anonymity um, uh, to address some of the harms online? I mean, there, there are always efforts in Congress, uh, whether, whether they're likely to be uh, materialized. Uh, it, I mean, there, there's been an effort for a, a national privacy law for more than a decade now. I have serious doubts. Uh, a lot of privacy is happening at the state level where I, I think s some of the laws may have some impact in terms of giving people control over their data, but I think it also places a very heavy burden on the individuals to say, you know, you have the ability to request that your information is deleted. Um, I mean, that most people aren't going to know where who has all of their data, who are the data brokers. So I, I think I, my hope would be a stronger federal law and particularly a law that really goes after the companies that traffic, the, the data brokers that traffic and in identifying information. But I, I've not seen anything, any indicators that we're actually going to get there. Uh, we, uh, what about encryption? I know that that's now an issue that's on the table given the horrors uh, that we just uh, had this week uh, with respect to the uh, Texas uh, storming of a school. Um, and some, apparently some of the perpetrators um, comments uh, uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I think it was on Instagram, which is encrypted, um, were um, previewed what was going to happen. Where, where is encryption in all of this and, and where do you see that going? So, I mean, I, I think David's report, uh, his 2015 report really nicely compared and contrasted the values of encryption and anonymity. And there's some uh, there are many similarities. I, I spend a chapter writing about Tor, which uh, is basically encrypted, encrypting routing information that helps people to be anonymous. Uh, I mean, I, the Texas case, I, I feel like we, I, I haven't read the news in a few hours, and I feel like we're still getting information on there. I don't, at least from what I've seen so far, I, even if you were to have eliminated encryption altogether, I don't, based on what we currently know, I don't know 
how that would have actually reduced the likelihood of what had happened. We still have Fourth Amendment protections, and the. It, but but again, we. I I think I very much worry uh, that every time there is a tragedy, encryption is the first thing that is attacked, and I think it can be very short sighted and really um, reduce our overall security quite a bit. Okay. Um, uh, you say in your book, or you conclude in your book, that America is better off due to our culture of anonymity empowerment, and that the good outweighs the bad. We're gonna be talking about both the good and the bad uh, in this session, but why do you reach that conclusion? So I reached that conclusion and I note that, you know, pe people can have different perspectives based on different life experiences and there's not a mathematical formula for it, but I think about all of the groups over the years, I mean, starting with some of the people who founded our country to the NAACP, to whistleblowers, uh, to so many people who are exposing uh, information that they could not do under their real name because they don't have the luxury of being able to do that. And uh, that that's why I think that the, the benefits are substantial. Now, I, obviously, and I spend uh, a whole chapter writing about a case where someone used Tor and other anonymity technologies to really persistently harass someone and really ruin her life and the lives of others around her. And I, I don't, um, the conclusion I draw from that is that there were a lot of other ways to have caught that early that law enforcement, schools, mental health providers, family missed. And so it ultimately was not necessarily an issue of anonymity, rather a lot of other uh, problems that all combined to lead to that. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, now I'd like to turn to David Kay. Uh, David, you're a law professor at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, and the former United Nations Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Opinion and Expression. David, anonymity online has enormous global implications. We see that uh, all the time now, particularly um, as it Im was impacted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What role does anonymity play in the context of international human rights? Right, thanks. thanks for that, Susan. And thanks so much for including me here. It's, I mean, it's really amazing to be with such great, uh, with you, with, um, with Kathleen, and with such an amazing panel, uh, all of whom, I mean, honestly, all of whom I, I really benefit from their work. So um, I'm gonna drop into the chat because Jeff has been so kind to mention my report twice, um, but I did a report on this topic uh, about seven years ago, uh, focused on anonymity and it, actually a, a, a probably more of a focus on encryption as a human right uh, or as a facilitator for certain human rights. And so let me just, to respond to your question, uh, answer it in maybe two separate ways. So one is, you know, my background and my, my area of focus is human rights and freedom of expression and to a certain extent privacy. And the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights protect in a really robust way the freedom, <clears throat> freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. And one of the interesting things about those documents, actually going to, back to the covenant, is that at the time of the negotiation of Article 19 of the covenant, which protects everyone's right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds. Uh, it was proposed by, by Brazil that there be a, a kind of footnote to that, that, that would say essentially that anonymity would not be permitted. And it was shot down pretty quickly by other governments that said, you know, essentially anonymity can be a tool for, for authors. For, and this is a negotiation in the 50s and 60s. And so there, you know, it didn't have the, the same online relevance that we might think of today, but it was understood at that time, even in an international context, that anonymity was a, a strong value. And, and so you've seen that echoed both in, in the development of human rights law, but also in the development of regional human rights standards, 
in the inter-American system, in the European system, but, but there are online threats. I mean, there are threats to anonymity online. Of course, part of it is social and cultural and, uh, and has a lot to do with the way people think about harassment, misogyny, hate speech, which actually, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't say depends, but gets a little bit of fuel from, from anonymity. But, but at the same time, we've seen governments over the last several years really seek to undermine uh, anonymity. We've seen, for example, Brazil and Venezuela and a couple other countries actually prohibit anonymity in their law or even their constitutional law. So we've seen that in the context of protest, um, you know, real significant uh, repression of, of anonymity for other reasons in order to identify people who might be in dissent. And tools such as facial recognition technologies have a very significant impact on people's abilities, whether in online space or in offline protest, their ability to, to engage in that kind of dissent. We've seen SIM card registration uh, around the world that requires uh, aligning your real identity with, with your mobile phone. We've seen the blocking of Tor, which uh, as Jeff has mentioned, is a real important um, anonymity tool for many people around the world. So, you know, I think that as we look around the world, we see on the one hand, I think strong human rights uh, protection as far as the framework goes, but a real sense that it's being uh, restricted and under, under threat in, in all sorts of ways, uh, both online and off. Uh, boy, that's uh, a great summary. Thank you very much, David. And, and we'll come back to some of those issues as we go along. Uh, Danielle Citron, you are a distinguished professor of law at the University of Virginia, where you focus on privacy, free expression, and civil rights. And in 2019, you were named a MacArthur Fellow for your groundbreaking work on cyberstalking and intimate security, uh, privacy. Please tell us, first of all, what is intimate privacy and how anonymity online impacts that? Thank you so much. And thank you for having me with all of my uh, good friends. Um, so intimate privacy is the information and access to the most, our, um, every aspect of our intimate life. So our bodies, our health, our innermost thought, our sexual activities, our sex, gender, sexual orientation, as well as our close relationships. And so it's access to and information about our kind of the most central sort of pieces of our, our lives. Um, intimate privacy. So what's interesting is that you might think that I would be in heated disagreement with, with Jeff and David, and I've learned so much from both of them. And I'm actually not, even though I do focus in my work on the dark side and abuses of network tools. The, the cyber stalking, which is often a perfect storm of, um, you know, privacy invasion. So the posting of nude photos, doxing people, you know, uh, revealing people's home addresses, defamation that often amounts to um, calling someone a prostitute or impersonating them on that basis, um, death and rape threats. And it's often a, a DDoS attacks. That is, it's all designed to silence, to make people unemployable, right? And to, to, to truly change and, and narrow the aperture of their lives. Um, so they can't work, they can't date, uh, and they're terrified, afraid to walk out of their houses. And anonymity does in some respects, right? Um, it would enable them, victims of online abuse, of course, um, to speak without having worry about being associated with their former name, right? Their names that have been completely decimated online in their Google CV. So in some ways, in anonymity is, is as an important tool for the abuse victim as it is, of course, for the perpetrator. And so and just to draw it back to intimate privacy, so, you know, what are the consequences of anonymity for intimate privacy? Um, it's true that for, for women and girls, you're much more likely than anyone else to end up on sites devoted to the exploitation of your nude images, that they will appear in Google searches of your names, that video voyeurism, sextortion, all the ways that individuals invade the intimate privacy of others 
um, you know, is often at the expense of women and, and minorities, so gender and sexual minorities. Um, but I guess what I want to say about anonymity and why I don't think I'm in necessarily disagreement with its importance as a value, and it is incredibly important, the political dissenters, the domestic violence victim, the victim of abuse, is that in many ways, anonymity, yes, does free perpetrators from the social stigma of being associated with abuse that they have perpetrated. Um, but it's also not only that, that piece, but the practical piece, which is law enforcement doesn't care doesn't want to do anything about it. So often intimate privacy violations are misdemeanors. And law enforcement, so the problem really isn't necessarily anonymity, right? Um, you could probably find these folks with enough you know, resources. It's just law enforcement doesn't care. And the other piece of this is you think of platforms, which the problem, you know, revenge porn operators will often say when they're interviewed, um, you know, what's your name? And the person will respond, I don't want to be associated with my site. <laughs> they get to escape, right, responsibility for the abuse that they enable. But really importantly is the lack of accountability inscribed in federal law in Section 230 of the Decency Act. So it's a multi-layered problem. And I think the easy, and this you get from, from Jeff's crucial book um, and, and David's work, is that the easy low hanging fruit is to say anonymity is the problem, right? That's the source of our troubles or encryption. And it's just not, right? It's a complicated problem that involves social attitudes, law enforcement, education, right? And 230, which I know we don't wanna spend a lot of time on, but I think it's worth noting that the picture is much more complicated. And as Jeff and, you know, in, in the United States of Anonymous is really clear, right? It's great value. And it's often the easy thing to say, oh, if we took that away, we wouldn't have any online abuse. And that's just as a matter of study, empirical study, not true, right? People are happy to be uh, vicious, cruel, criminals in their own names. Um, and so I guess I have to say, I'm a fan, I, I support anonymity. I think it's a, it's a privilege that can be lost when you commit crimes and intimate privacy violations. So thank you thank so much you. for having me with my oh. amazing call. We are uh, so pleased that you are here and, and your points are spot on. Jeff Jarvis, you're a professor of journalism innovation at the Newmark Journalism School at City University of New York, and you're director of the Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism. Um, does the current focus on addressing harmful content, which is something we see in Europe, for example, lots of, of different types of legislation here in the United States have been built and the like, does that focus actually threaten the right to anonymity? And also, does the other current focus on defending privacy conflict with the efforts to curb anonymity? First, Susan, thank you for having me and Kathleen. I'm uh, honored and humbled to be in this august crew. I didn't go to law school, I cheated and went into journalism. So uh, I, I don't know nearly as much as, as my fellow colleagues here. Um, and speaking from a media perspective and the history of media, uh, identity has been a yoke of control of speech. That's why I'm so glad that Jeff has, has made the First Amendment central to his theses about this. And we've seen this through time. Uh, we saw it in, in, in post-print uh, England, where uh, the first effort was to control the publisher, the platform that is, the printer, uh, next to control the reader and those who were reading forbidden uh, information. And then finally, one could argue that authorship was in part born uh, by the requirement for the authors of, of written works to identify themselves so they could be controlled. And, and I think we see that this, this identity is a path to control. And um, so, so now when we see in the UK, the effort to, to eradicate harmful content, so-called or, or legal but harmful content, they're going after the platforms, but I don't think it's long before they'll figure out how to move past the problem of scale to go to the creator. Meanwhile, also in the UK, you have pornography uh, legislation now requiring identity to consume, uh, so-called, uh, that content. That is a harm on identity. And, and yes, anonymity, uh, I hear this all the time. I started first news sites in my career in, in 1995. 
And, and I've always heard people say, if we only get rid of anonymity, as Danielle said, uh, you know, people think everything's going to be okay, and it's provably false. We know assholes by name. Um, but there's this, this, this effort to believe that there's an easy fix here for the problems that are, in fact, inherent in society. And so um, I, I see the, the countervailing pressure now is you have the harm, legal but harmful in the UK, but in the US, you now have the right wing here uh, trying to compel speech, uh, any legal speech. Uh, so in the end, all of this, I think, is not so much about anonymity as it is about speech. Anonymity can be a cloak for cowards, but it is a shield for the vulnerable. It enables speech. The earliest American publications were all written anonymously. Uh, and, and I think that the fetish with identity is in part the fault of media, and it came much later. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'd like now to open it up to the, to the panel as a whole. Let me ask a question that I asked uh, Jeff Kossif in the very beginning, and I, I think you, each one of you has kind of touched on this. Is America better off with a strong culture of anonymity and empowerment? Does the good outweigh the bad? Does anyone want to pick up on that? Jeff, Jarvis? Oh, um, absolutely, we're better off with it. Uh, just as we're better off with more speech today than we've ever had. Uh, we had a very limited um, ecosystem of media that allowed only those with the privilege of the press to speak. Now anyone can. I value that speech. It's, it's too often devalued. And much of it needs to occur anonymously, not just for, for safety from authorities, but also for the ability to experiment with identities, to experiment with with. Um, association. And it's a mechanism for the full breadth of the First Amendment, not only to speak, but also to associate and to act. Uh, we talked a little bit about advances in technology. Um, how do they protect or unmask anonymous speakers or those who receive information? Some of it is basically the inferential unmasking, the use of troves of data to identify someone who wants to be anonymous. Is anonymity going to be a thing of the past? Anyone want to pick up on that? I, can, I mean, I, I think people are going to have to work harder at it. Uh, and I, in the book, I talk about some cases both with sympathetic and not sympathetic online speakers who uh, ended up being unmasked because they would just occasionally say things where by themselves were not identifiable, but in aggregate they were. And I mean, part of it comes down to the individuals in being very careful. Uh, that becomes much harder when you have, have such a large foot, footprint online. But I do urge people if they want to be anonymous online, you really need to work uh, and not, not assume that what you're doing won't be linked back to you. Anyone else want to chime in? It's true. It's really so. I don't know if anyone has read or should read Julia Angwin's uh, book, in which she talks about her ability, like her efforts to to keep her own privacy in a networked age, and it's impossible. You know, like carrying a Faraday bag around, and the, the it's just you. It's almost um, be, and given the fact that we have no protection, no meaningful protection, consumer protection approach in the United States is such a weak, thin read for protection that, you know, the idea that we have to almost stop using all these online tools to reclaim, as Jeff says, like our anonymity, which is nearly impossible. You know, part of the, the huge part of the problem is the lack of strong regulation. And I call for the recognition of a civil right and a human right to intimate privacy. Platforms should not, and, uh, you know, period tracking apps and, and all these providers should not be in the business of selling our intimate information. Data brokers shouldn't have them, right? We shouldn't have data brokers whose business is location that they have bought from apps. So, you know, we, we are in a big, difficult time, right? To preserve civil rights and civil liberties in the, in the face of inexorable, profitable demands for our data. And so we need such a strong protection. Jeff, I know you're skeptical, but I have tools at the ready, if we're ready to protect, right? That would minimize collection, that would stop and prevent the sale. Does that make sense? Like, I know that we are, have all of our cynical eyes on because we work with staff and we're like, not again, a stupid idea. But, you know, <laughs> what's nice about everyone on this call 
right? All of us, even Jeff, I know you say you didn't have a law degree, but you have great ideas. But as we have these tools at the ready, um, if folks will listen for the protection of privacy and speech. Well, we oftentimes look to Europe um, because they are far um, uh, more advanced in finding legislative or regulatory solutions for many reasons. But um, they do already have in place the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. How have we seen, uh, does anybody know if comparatively we have seen far fewer problems in Europe as a consequence of GDPR? And if not, that's an interesting uh, research piece. Uh, Daniel, you were shaking your head. I know, because GDP isn't the solve. That is, they're th a little thicker procedural protections, but not that much. So that the procedural commitments of you can know and have individual control and ask to delete and to sell is pretty meaningless because we don't have the time and there isn't delete at scale, my intimate information, right? And so it's not that it does nothing, but it is a small step. We need substantive protections. So people will say, oh, Europe is better. I'm like, no, <laughs> right? That is, even if we followed the prescriptions of GDPR, we would be left with procedural, largely, largely procedural protections that don't get us where we need to go for substantive commitments. Maybe, maybe Susan, if I could just add something to that, because I think that was, I mean, on top of the, or sort of in addition to the fact that the GDPR and its enforcement has been pretty weak in, in all sorts of ways, there's also on, on the freedom of expression side, and in particular on the side of intermediary liability. So the liability that, that companies actually, um, you know, may, may have in the face of the content that's posted on their platforms, the European Court of Human Rights in a 2014 decision known as Delphi, basically upheld the, um, the liability, it was uh, upheld a, an Estonian law that imposed liability on a platform, it was essentially a news platform for the anonymous defamatory or hate speech, whatever you want to call it, um, in, in this particular case. And so, you know, Europe's approach hasn't been, um, I would say, as protective of anonymity generally. And um, and I think there's reason to believe that um, as, as the law develops, uh, that, that it won't be as protective as, for example, the First Amendment has been uh, in, in the US context. Any other thoughts? Okay. You don't kill me, yeah, Susan. Ahead, Can I Dan. say one thing? Because this is something I've learned so much from David Kay, um, who came to speak to my class, my free speech in a digital age class, um, when he reminds us that European commitments have us think about and balance proportionality. That is, we have strong interests, we have rights, but not, we don't have trumps in Europe. And I think that is an important piece, that when we think about important protections for free speech and for privacy, that, that they're not that viewed they're as trumps. Not viewed as they're viewed as um, and should be understood as having us engaged in an important balancing act and a recognition of interests of all sides and that we that we must weigh them together rather than viewing them in isolation. So that, that commitment, so I don't mean to make fun of Europe at all, right? The GDPR is not great, but the broader commitments to proportionality and necessity that that approach of thinking about rights and balance and how we do that carefully is one that I do think is worth. Um, and David's argued in his book, Speech Police, that we ought to think about as a guide. I, I'll, I'll just quickly add, I, I think there's the state laws that I was talking about earlier are not exactly GDPR, but they're taking a lot of the same data protection concepts and creating a patchwork now of all. And I, I think uh, Ari Waldman's new book excellently demonstrates how this is great for sort of the privacy lawyer community, but uh, beyond that, is it really creating these meaningful protections? And it's a little scary to, to I, I worry that we're uh, in the United States now just kind of 
uh, saying, okay, well, this is going to be enough now that the privacy policies are now like five times as long. Um, so that I, it's concerning that some of that is really spilling over here. Yeah. Um, Jeff Jarvis, I think we're getting some uh, feedback from your mic for some reason. Uh, one of the things that uh, has struck me recently, uh, just the other day, a group of more than 40 Democrats sent a letter to Google urging it to stop collecting and storing location data, such as cell phone data, out of concern that it could be used by prosecutors through geofence warrants to target individuals seeking abortions. What would you advise a platform to do? Who wants to pick up that one? Danielle? Question uh, is, unmute. what? Oh yes, okay. So just to be clear, the, the question is, what ought platforms do in the face of... Um, or let's, let's, yeah, let's think a little bit about how um, uh, either individuals, these uh, folks who are going to be reporting, folks who have participated in or assisted in abortion in Texas, for right. example, um, could they go online, uh, inferential uh, data conclusions about something or um, location, for example, and, um, and report somebody as uh, potentially having had an abortion or the like. Um, are we concerned about that? And, and, and what should we be thinking about that? As I mentioned, some of the senators, uh, it wasn't just senators, I think members of the House as well, uh, ask Google to stop collecting and storing location data for that. So that's when you have a crisis or a, a viewed on crisis, oftentimes the reaction is we got to do something. And that was the reaction they had. But is that a wake up call? What does that mean? Go ahead. So it's, it strikes me that there is no question that cyber mobs will pursue in states in which abortion is becomes a crime, and that's soon to be half the states in the United States, and indeed Dobbs, the leak draft is what it is, that we're going to see people targeting women and girls who obtain abortions, as well as providers and their supporters. Um, it's as easy as privacy invaders go to spying inc, you know, companies, data brokers buy that information, and through, through circumstantial, you know, using inferences based on your period tracking app information, you got your period, you didn't get your period, you got your period again. You also went to a provider, even if in a different state through geolocation, it's gonna be easy for individuals to, whatever the motive, right? To identify women and girls and providers who have helped attain abortions, much in the way that we saw the Nuremberg files. That was a website devoted to the outing and murder of abortion providers. Um, set up by a pro-life group. Um, and what it would do was list, and this website has now been taken down, there was a lawsuit, but the it included the names of abortion providers where they lived. And then would, when they were murdered, their names would appear like X'd out in black. When they were only injured, it would appear in dark gray, right? So websites devoted to intimidating doctors from performing abortions and as well as murdering them. Right. And are we going to see vigilante crazy bounty hunting as the Texas law encourages? You bet we are. And so I guess my deep fear and is the way in which individuals, companies are the handmaidens of government surveillance and individuals, too, are going to take vigilante justice out on women and girls and doctors. And so I'm terrified. I have to say, like, I, you know, uh, all things considered intimate privacy and our refusal to protect it in a strong and meaningful way is now going to be weaponized against women and girls by individuals and by governments. I'll, I'll also just add that you ge, uh, geofence warrants scare the crap out of me. Uh, I, I think that I, I'm hoping we, we haven't had that many court opinions yet uh, on the Fourth Amendment uh, challenges to them, but I'm hoping that we get some good case law um, they, they, they have the potential to do so much damage to, to so many people. And we're already seeing that, 
Um, unfortunately, so much of it never even is in a position where it can be challenged. But I, I'm really hoping the Supreme Court at least has had a pretty decent Fourth Amendment uh, track record in recent years. And I'm hoping that uh, they that something gets there soon to be able to at least limit this. Before Maybe, we Susan, if I could also, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just no, wanted no, to jump ahead, in. I just wanted to jump in here because I think both, you know, what Danielle and Jeff have said is, is so important for highlighting the ways in which online security and the responsibility of platforms is, you know, a lot of the public debate has focused on the perpetrators, but they've really highlighted, I think, the ways in which anonymity and security are really important for the vulnerable. And, um, and that's, I just think that, that it's, that's not, unfortunately, it hasn't been a big part of the public conversation. And I imagine that, that Jeff's book can kind of spark that part of the conversation as well. I mean, the, the other thing that, that I wanted to mention was just how interesting this conversation is from the perspective of legal and other constraints or rules. Because on the one hand, we can talk a lot about law, whether it's First Amendment or human rights law or new privacy regulations. But at the same time, you know, there's there, there's kind of a policy conversation having around what the platforms should and shouldn't do. Because a, a lot of the platform rules around anonymity are really ones that they have certainly under, under US law, they have the ability, the power to make those rules as they see fit. So for example, you can have a real name, a real identification policy for Facebook and something totally different, or at least a little bit different over at, at Twitter or another platform. And I think what that enables us to do really is to think about this from a kind of a deep policy perspective. Like what do we want? Not just what does the law constrain us to do, but also what what should the platforms, what should, what's their optimal rule for both protecting the vulnerable, but also providing you know, some uh, kind of response to those who would abuse that particular space for, for speech. If, if I can join in too, because you asked such a provocative sure. question, Susan, uh, and, I, and I absolutely agree with everything that, that Danielle put forth in, in her um, fears about what's going to happen. Uh, but I also always worry when I see an overarching, and I'm not accusing Danielle of this at all, but it, 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 unfortunately it's going to be, get used into what I see as an overarching um, uh, demonization of data, um, a moral panic about the net and about information. And um, you know, we also have a right, to, uh, 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 Google has a right to run a business. Media companies use personal information and should use it more to get away from mass media into relevance. Um, being able to know when I search for pizza, I get local pizza is a valuable service. And so I don't want to see this in a position where we lose sight of the real enemy here, which is bad court, bad laws, bad politics, uh, and, 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 and fall into a trap of accusing technology, the internet and platforms of doing something that they're only being exploited for. And we also need to protect their right to knowledge. And, and the knowledge that can come out of the data that, that we exhaust in our activities. And I apologize for my New York background noise. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like now to open the floor to questions from everyone who's joined us. If you'd like to ask a brief question, please press the raise hand button found under the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. When I call on you, please unmute your mic and then mute it again afterwards. And while that is happening, let me go back. Uh, we haven't talked uh, very much about Section 230. So I'm going to introduce that uh, now. Um, Jeff Kossif, um, you had proposed in your book to assist victims of anonymous trolls a legislative change to Section 230 that would allow courts to enforce injunctions against platforms to take down material that has been adjudicated to be illegal or defamatory in a lawsuit between the victim and the poster. Can you please explain? Yeah, so this has been a controversial area. Uh, the California Supreme Court, in a pretty divided opinion, uh, 
said where there was a defamation lawsuit that resulted in a default judgment uh said uh section 230 uh at least the plurality said section 230 meant that the platform did not have to take down the the material uh i think it's a close call uh i'm persuaded by chris cox who is one of the authors of section 230 who said you know that he never intended for it to reach that far and i i think that if I, there are legitimate concerns, uh, including if someone's forging court orders, uh, if they're doing that, I think we have an issue of people forging court orders. Uh, there's also an issue of ensuring that the court, even in the case of a default judgment, would apply some scrutiny to the claim. Uh, so I don't, I don't think, I, I think there would have to be some caveats, but I do think that if there is a fair adjudication, and it's determined to be defamatory or otherwise outside the scope of protection. I, I don't. I, I, I think that um, it could really assist some of really some of the worst case scenarios of being able to have the material taken down. Any reactions? Any other comments uh, on two thirty, Danielle? It's okay. Y'all know. <laughs> My big mouth on 2.30 is always ready. So I think that there's some often myths about the fat, you know, the pathologies of 2.30. But what's wrong is not the overfiltering pr provision, um, 2.30 C2, but rather 2.30 C1, which the title of the statute is Good Samaritan Blocking and Filtering of Offensive Content, Right. And 230C1 has been very broadly understood that if you underfilter or you, you filter too little, right? You don't remove, you block, respond, then you are free from liability as a, as a speaker or a publisher. Now that provision has been really broadly understood, not just to, you know, lawsuits based on with terms of art like defamation, speaking and publishing, but rather just to preempt all types of litigation. Um, and I think we need to go back to Cox and Wyden. What, what did they initially want? They wanted to provide incentives, right, to self-regulation. They wanted platforms to be responsible, to be good Samaritans. So I think, and I propose with Ben Wittes and then have been developing in my work, that we condition Section 230C1, right, the underfiltering provision on being a good Samaritan. And how we get at that is conditioning that, that, that legal shield on engaging in reasonable content moderation in the face of illegality that causes serious harm. Um, and in that way, you have to prove on a motion to dismiss. And so I have a new piece coming out in BU Law Review, which I'm really clear about what I mean by this proposal, but you've got to show that writ large as to the certain types of illegality engaged in the lawsuit that you've been engaging in reasonable content moderation practices and having worked with companies for 12 years in trust and safety, um, practices have emerged. Reasonable steps is not something that we don't know anything about. In fact, I provide 12 easy, reasonable steps that I've seen companies engage in and have worked with Twitter and Facebook, Spotify, Bumble, right, on these very practices. And so, yes, it will be expensive. Yes, it may deter some activity, but what's at stake often is the, what I understand is a civil right to intimate privacy that is being destroyed willy-nilly. Um, and so, uh, you know, people don't like this, absolutely happy to be criticized and talk about the downsides. But I think we, if we don't recognize that doing nothing is really costly to speech, and that's the speech of the people in the face of online assault and intimate privacy violations, I have empirical evidence that can tell you they've been silenced. There are real costs to free speech in providing this legal shield to bad Samaritans. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, I'd like to go to questions. Uh, Peter Fatelnik, you have your hand up. Good afternoon, everybody. And so many thanks for having me. A fascinating conversation. And I want to be sort of really quick here. Uh, I think one of the speakers referred to, and I almost quote, anonymity should be a privilege which should be lost with criminal behavior. I think it went around that. I was wondering, to which degree regulation can then sort of use pseudonymity as a mechanism to sort of go between the two, anonymity and identity? 
Is this something which has a regulatory relevance, pseudonymity, or a technological relevance? Thank you. Who would like to respond? I feel like everyone's getting tiring of me, but I did say that, that is anonymity as a privilege that can be lost, right, rather than a right. And in my reasonable, so Peter, in my reasonable steps proposal, you asked, you know, is this could be a regulatory move, right? Um, that engaging in reasonable steps to address illegality online that causes serious harms includes that when a person comes to a platform and says, I'm in the face of online abuse, please track this user that's targeting me with intimate privacy violations, right? With cyber stalking, that the platform, a reasonable content moderation practice is to then keep that information. Should they receive a properly issued court subpoena, right? Or warrant. Um, and that would enable accountability, right? Not as a, I, I, I'm allergic to the idea that you can't view porn without registering, <laughs> right? So this is quite different. This is in the face of court process. That is, you, you learn the information, you keep it, and then have to turn it over once you have a properly issued court subpoena or warrant. Okay. Uh, all right, let's go to uh, two more questions. Uh, ask the questions one after the other, please. Allison Balser, and then uh, Joseph Toro. Allison, are you there? I am. Thank you so much for this presentation and for taking my question today. Um, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm a policy wonk. So I apologize if this is uh, broader than the legalities. But the recent leaked Supreme Court opinion on abortion seems to go further than just uh, Roe versus Wade and really digs deep into what legal underpinnings a right to privacy we may have. Can I ask for a reaction to that and how that might change this conversation going forward? Okay, anyone wanna pick up on that? We talked a little bit about, um, about the abortion question, but it is in fact, as Allison was pointing out, it potentially much broader. Any, uh, Jeff Kossif? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, so the constitutional protections for anonymous speech, at least, that I've been talking about, those are all primarily under the First Amendment. And I mean, there are some I touched on briefly where I think the Fourth Amendment should do more. But in terms of the substantive due process, privacy protections, while I think they should come into play more for anonymity. They, we, we haven't seen that as much. Now, I think uh, Danielle, sorry, sorry to keep uh, put, putting you on the spot, but I, I think really relevant to the work that you've been doing uh, might, might be able to uh, shed more light on it. But I think at least for the sort of core First Amendment anonymity protections, uh, other than the fact that it's showing the Supreme Court might just be able to overrule whatever, overturn whatever it wants to, whenever it wants to. Um, that I think that might be an indicator. Any other panelists? Danielle, did you? No, want so to I think we're in for brace yourselves, right? The, that is the yeah. rights that the court is going to, I think, disassemble. Um, there are quite a few, the right to substantive, the right to privacy that the court recognizes, which is really an autonomy, right? Um, and about in, in one, autonomy over one's intimate life and body, um, I think we're going to see the falling of many other rights. Um, I don't think it's going to be cordoned off to cases involving the fetus, right? It's traditional understandings of the 14th Amendment's due process, all of that contraception, marriage, the ability to marry whoever we want, gay marriage, right? I think we're in for a ride. So the, that is, if indeed it's illegitimate, to recognize under the 14th Amendment substantive due process clause, rights that weren't recognized at the time of the founding of or the adoption of the amendment in 1868, then there are a whole lot of rights that we're gonna see fall. Okay, uh, Joseph Toro and uh, then Daniel Castro, please ask your question, Joseph, and then I'll have uh, Daniel ask his question. We can respond to both. Sure, uh, thank you. This has really been fascinating and illuminating. I I help. Uh, I am on the treadmill, so that's why you don't want to see me. Anyway, the, the reason I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 
I wanted to push back a little bit against Josh Jarvis, whom I respect greatly, particularly Jeff, with respect to your pizza example. Um, the, the issue of uh, location privacy is so problematical. There's no reason, for example, why uh, Google has to store data about where your pizza shop is when you go and search for pizza. Now, I understand they say that you need it for search. If you read their privacy policy, nobody could figure out how they get the data they get from a location standpoint, nobody. They just assert it and they, and they say why it's good for you. And of course, there are third parties that can literally sell in nanoseconds where you are from a geofencing position, you know, whether you're going to Starbucks or another coffee shop and give you discounts that could easily be used for the kinds of things that Danielle brought up. So it's very, very complicated. And I think that uh, to bring ethics in may not be the point, but that may be a place to start. Um, mm -hmm. How do you deal with location when it can be very useful, but also incredibly harmful and unethical? Okay, thank you. And Daniel, uh, Daniel Castro, please. Sure, so um, not on a treadmill, but I'll keep my camera off. Um, privacy activists have traditionally resisted national IDs and electronic IDs, particularly in the US, because they saw that as a loss of anonymity. Um, but obviously, electronic IDs are a good way of allowing anonymity while addressing different types of online harms, such as what we're seeing with the UK online safety bill to protect children. So for example, an adult can log into a website for adults by only proving they're over 21, but not actually revealing their identity. So just any thoughts on whether or how we can change the conversation around electronic IDs or national IDs and anonymity? Thanks. Okay. Who would like to respond to both of those questions? Uh, Jeff, quickly. Josh. I'll take the first since, since I, was, I also I have great respect for Joseph Turo, all the more so because he double, uh, double tasks by exercising while watching. Um, uh, I, I take your point, but I also go back, I'm old enough to go back in the pre-internet media world where we dealt with companies like Axiom that had huge amounts of data. And um, and there wasn't the, the, the fear of it. Now I'll grant that the use of it can be different today, but what I'm trying to argue is that I think we need a discussion which we're having at a level of principles rather than at the level of specifics. Uh, I think oftentimes location data is harmless when I have it in my ways and it knows my drives, I'm glad for that. That's a choice I make. I can I can erase it. I can be anonymous. I can do that. But I like the fact that it's stored and used again. And I don't think that it is an evil necessarily to do that. The problems are never, I think, in the, in the gathering of data, but in the use of data. And that's the discussion we need to have at a level of principle and then enforce that at a general level rather than the specifics that I would raise there. Okay, and did anyone want to respond to Daniel Castro before we go to closing comments? Uh, the the electronic IDs, uh, which is uh, a, a whole area that um, we're now more and more beginning to look at. Anyone? Okay, okay. Um, uh, I am kicking myself because I only scheduled an hour for this conversation and it clearly is, uh, has so much meat to it uh, that we could have gone on well beyond that. But um, since we have committed everybody to an hour, if we could have just uh, very short closing comments from our speakers, uh, beginning with Jeff Kossif. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, so uh, th this has just been so great uh, to speak with some of my favorite people about this really important subject. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I think that a lot of the values uh, that really are inherent in the anonymity uh, dialogue for decades are more important than ever. And I also think that they are at stake, uh, I think, particularly when it comes to government uh, access of people's data. Uh, as, as Danielle was point, pointing out with the geolocation data, I, I think so I think that it's really more important than ever to really focus on both the legal and technological solutions to protect anonymity going forward. Okay, um, and David Kay, your thoughts? Great. Well, I just wanted to, to thank you, Susan, for pulling everybody together. This was really excellent. It's, it's just so great to see everybody. I think the, the one thing that I just want to 
kind of re-emphasize is in a way a point that, that Danielle made about human rights law and its focus on necessity and proportionality. And the, the only thing that I, that I really wanted to add to that was that in, when we think about restrictions on anonymity, it's not, to my mind, only a question of the balancing, but it's also a question of ensuring that any public authority or private authority that's seeking to restrict anonymity has to demonstrate, like it is their burden to demonstrate the, the need for, the necessity and proportionality of those kinds of restrictions. And I think that it certainly for, for companies, it provides a, a pretty solid basis for making some of those decisions, but they need to be subjected to oversight uh, as, you know, as these issues move forward. Danielle, thank you very much, David. Danielle. Echoing uh, David's thanks to you, Susan, for bringing us together and for Jeff for writing his wonderful book. Um, and I'm gonna echo David in saying that we have assumed that this marketplace of data and then the subsequent loss of anonymity um, is, is a given that it's an unmitigated good. And we, I want the proof, <laughs> right? Just as David says, like we need, that is it's because our intimate privacy is on the line, we need a really good reason um, for its violation. And that includes anonymity and location. We just, companies say it's good for us. We, are, we should be grateful they're ga gathering our data, but I wanna know how it's so good for us. And we, these companies read really good reasons for why they ought to be able to collect, and certainly to okay. monetize it. Thank you. And Jeff Jarvis. I, I just think that as the, as the non-lawyer here, non-legal scholar, just a plain old journalist, it strikes me that in my field in media, we have to do a better job of selling the value of anonymity, the creativity and the speech that can arise as a result, the democratic discussion uh, among the vulnerable that can occur as a result, especially now when people are being attacked, uh, when we're going to see efforts to uh, perform government policy through lawsuits against individuals. Uh, anonymity is more important than ever. Thank you. That's a great way of summing up the conversation. It, this has been truly an enlightening discussion about the past and the future of anonymity online and what can be done to mitigate harms while preserving its profound role in protecting democracy, not just in the US, but around the world. I want to thank our panelists, Jeff Kossif, David Kay, Danielle Citron, and Jeff Jarvis for their thoughtful and sometimes thought-provoking analysis. And thank Kathleen Hall Jamison and our marvelous team at Annenberg Public Policy Center, Karen Riley, Gary Gaiman, Lana uh, Zulit for hosting this round table. And also thank all of you for joining today and your contributions to the discussion. Thank you all very much. <laughs>